Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Championship Leadership Podcast, and I am excited today. I've been uh, I've been a little bit persistent with uh, our guest today, Caroline Johnson, and and trying to get her on the show. Came across her book, uh, incredible story. Uh, her book is called Jet Girl, and um, I'm just excited to have you here, Caroline. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Nate, thanks so much for uh, tracking me down and for having me on the show today. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's get right into it. The first question I love to ask is, the name of the podcast is Championship Leadership. So what really comes to mind for you? What, it, what does that mean to you when you hear Championship Leadership? So leadership is something that's near and dear to my heart. And for me, it's really a process. It's been a process throughout my entire adult career from the Naval Academy through flying fighter jets in the Navy to becoming a leadership instructor at the Naval Academy and now being on, in the private sector as a leadership speaker. And so it's really about evolving as a person. So I focus on three key things. So the individual, the team, and then the greater organization that you're in. And so for me, it's a process of developing that internal grit and leadership mindset and what really defines you and then spreading it out into those bigger arenas so the team and the organization but we can talk about that i love leadership and i'm excited to talk about it today yeah absolutely and well yeah i mean coming from uh the naval academy that is you know it's all about leadership right inside of uh the naval academy and, and going into being an officer and uh and, and flying fast planes and jets and uh, all the experiences that you got for that so uh, first the first question it, you grew up in Colorado Springs, is that right? That is correct. Isn't Air that Force Town. the Air Force <laughs> Academy? What yes. happened there? <laughs> Everyone asked me that. Oh, okay, yeah, I was like. They say, what is this? Why didn't you go to the Air Force Academy? And I, you know, I have a couple different answers, but I never wanted to stay in my hometown. Yeah. I have this desire to travel and explore new places. And so to go to the Naval Academy, where I could be on the East Coast, close to New York and Philadelphia, that was a huge draw for me. And then yeah. Navy towns, I don't know if you know, are a little bit better than Air Force and Army <laughs> towns. So we're always on the water. And, and that yeah, was for sure. Yeah. I was just, uh, I just went, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Navy Special Warfare uh, in San Diego. Oh, and yeah. I was like, oh, this is beautiful down here. It's like, you would have no, I don't know if you've been there or not, but um, driving around there, we're driving into uh, the Navy, Navy Special Warfare where they train the SEALs and SEALs candidates and they're running around. It's like, it's in the middle of San Diego. Like you would never think that like these elite warriors are being trained right in the middle of like this just beautiful paradise, but that's where- Prime happens. real estate on Coronado. Yeah. Oh, I no mean, doubt. their obstacle course is literally the, the most prime real estate you can get. Yeah. And then they get to get wet and sandy in the beach and oh <laughs> yep. my gosh. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Totally. Um, so yeah, we got a little off track there. I, you know, I was like Colorado Springs, cause I was just there. I did a Fort Carson, did a Spartan race this past summer. And anyway, but I could, I could definitely understand. Yeah. Wanting to get away from home if that's where you grew up and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and go on that route. Um, who, well, yeah, tell us a little bit about your story, maybe a little bit more for the listeners that aren't as familiar with you. Like, um, what did take you on the path to go the route you did and, and, uh, what made you write the book and maybe tell us a little bit more about that and just your experiences and how you've gotten to the path that you are today. Yeah. So I, as a kid, I marched the beat of my own drum from the get go. Uh, my parents, you know, I was a very driven child at the age of three. My mom tells a story that they put training wheels on my bike and said, you will ride with these. And she found me in the garage two hours later with a wrench in hand, <laughs> one training wheel off. And then the next one was on its way. And she's like, all right. That's awesome. It, kid. <laughs> yeah. And so never did anyone expect that the Navy and the military, which is a very regimented driven path, you know, would be yeah. the way that I would go. Um, and so I was very fortunate in that my brother pursued the path first and he went to the Naval Academy two years ahead of me. We came from a non-military family. My dad's a businessman, my mom, a small business owner. And so for us to kind of pivot and take that path was unusual. So he led the way. He's a very different personality than me, you know, very easy going, happy to comply. And then I followed along. And so <laughs> My Naval Academy days weren't always easy. I was kind of butting <laughs> up against the system and, you know, yeah. I didn't like people to tell me what to do, but I thrived. I absolutely loved it. I loved being challenged and I loved being pushed beyond my comfort zone. And so 
I, I really fell in love with it at that point. And so at that time at the Naval Academy, women could really only do three key things. And that was drive ships, um, be Marines or go aviation. And driving ships was frankly too slow for my lifestyle. I yeah. like to move fast. <laughs> and, and then being a Marine, whoa, way too many rules, couldn't do that. And so aviation, I was like, man, the people are cool. The job is amazing. I'm gonna do that. And so I selected to go down to Pensacola flight school as a naval flight officer. So that means I was goose. I sat in the back of the plane, did goose. weapons bombs, um, but selected all the way through. So it, the way flight school works, I'm not sure if many people know, um, there's many different selection points. So it's like a highway with different off ramps. And as you select through, those people who fly jets stay on that highway and everyone else selects into helicopters and reconnaissance planes. And so I stayed number one in my class and was able to select my number one choice every time. And that was flying fighter jets in Virginia Beach. And so super fortunate to be able to do that. Um, we'll talk about it later. I had a very historic deployment when we went in 2014. We did um, interacted with some Russians, did Afghanistan operations, supported first free elections over there, and then really kicked off Iraq and Syria for the first time since 2011, that fight against ISIS. And so, we can talk about it. We we had a lot of historic events. The first people to neutralize ISIS, first woman to drop bombs on ISIS, and then first strikes in Syria. So it was pretty groundbreaking stuff that never in a million years did I expect that that, that would be what I would do. So. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, that's 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 amazing. How many how many uh, female naval uh, officers were in the program with you? Yeah, so in naval aviation, women are definitely a minority. So just to give you a scope, nationally and internationally, just um, Delta pilots, Southwest, you know, private pilots, women make up about 6% of aviation. Yeah. And so the Navy actually beats that number. We have about 11% of women okay. in aviation. Um, in the fighter community, though, when I was flying, it was 1.7% women. Yeah. So we were few and far between. Now we're up to 3.6%. And so... The numbers are growing, which is great, but yeah. uh, still a little ways to go. Yeah, that's incredible. So um, I, what sparked the book? Yeah, I, I never wanted to write a book, actually. And yeah. um, when I came back from deployment in 2014, it just a serendipitous meeting um, of a family friend up in Michigan. And we were talking and he's uh, one of my pilots and I had flown up to Michigan for the weekend to do a training trip. And we were kind of standing on the dock one afternoon and started talking to this guy. And he said, oh, wow, OK, you guys flew up to Michigan this weekend. We said, yeah. He goes, oh, Delta United. I think he thought we were boyfriend, girlfriend, and we were uh -huh. not. Uh, <laughs> we're like, oh, no, we flew ourselves. And we, he's a big New York guy. And he goes, oh, like a G6. You flew a G6 up. And we we're like, no, uh, just like a fighter jet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you he's know, like, just a fighter jet. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, now I know you're lying to me. He's like, yeah. women, women don't fly fighter jets. And uh, I was just <laughs> like, oh, well, actually we do and we're pretty yeah. good at it and yeah. so he was like whoa i'm so sorry but so totally serendipitous this guy happened to be an author um oh, in wow. addition to his day job of being a chief marketing officer for a tech startup and he said you gotta write a book he heard about my story you know said, asked have you been to war <laughs> we're like well it's called combat yeah. um and yes we just got yeah. back and he he learned about our story he goes wow i had no idea you got to tell your story and so this guy pursued me for six to nine months of emailing, calling. I blocked him, I pushed him off, you know how it goes. Yeah, I was gonna and, say, I'm very familiar with this part of the story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so he finally got through to me and talked to me and um, it was, I was listening to your podcast with Chase Adams earlier and it, it was talking about finding your vision and using that to drive the achievements that you do. And so for me in the book, it was really finding that vision and that was inspiring and empowering the next generation to do things that they never knew were possible. And so for me, being a woman, going through the program, I didn't know any women who went ahead of me, you know, who were these guiding lights of when I was younger. Yeah. And so if I could be that person for young men and young women saying, hey, this girl or woman who didn't even know it was possible, you know, was the last person in the world who thought she would do it, you know, if she could survive and then thrive, I can too. And so that's where the book came about. 
long-winded well, story, it. I know. But. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did. It's a story that needs to be heard. And and um, and have you seen that impact? Like, are you making an impact? Are there other uh, young women, girls uh, reaching out to you and like, as like, man, you're so you're so inspiring. I love your story. Thank you. Um, is is that starting to happen for you? Because one hundred percent, you bled. Yeah. My inbox is full. And literally wow. right before I logged on this podcast, you know, another popped up in my inbox. And, you know, that is the most fulfilling thing that could ever happen mm -hmm. is having people reach out and say, you know what, you really changed my mind about things. And, or I'm an aspiring naval aviator and your story has changed my life. Or, awesome. you know, all these different notes and being able to be there for people and say, hey, not only thank you for reaching out, but please let me know if I can support you as you go through your journey and then continuing to follow up and say, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and pushing people to achieve their dreams. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And I would imagine that you make the path and the road a little bit easier, hopefully for those that follow. Was it, was it, was it difficult for you or was it like, you know, just everyone that's here going through aviation schools is treated the same. Was there, was there any, stories that you have about that any difficulties yeah. roadblocks that you ran into yeah 100 percent. so I, I think everyone has their own struggles going through you know whether it was going through the army or rising up in the private sector every single person who's been successful has encountered roadblocks and encountered obstacles that they've had to overcome along the way and that's something that makes us all successful because it develops yeah. resilience and it develops grit and so i too had struggles um Going through the Naval Academy, I probably created a lot of my own struggles due to my personality <laughs> yeah. and, and the things that I like to do. However, when I got to flight school, I will say, you know, I loved it. I thrived. It was everything that I needed to be successful. So the right balance of freedom and challenge, and it was totally self-driven. And that's, for me, where I thrive most. Where I encountered real challenge was not during the flight training was when I got to my actual operational unit. So my fleet squadron is what we call that. And that's the unit that you deploy with. And for me, it was challenges that I had never faced before. And I will say I'm very, you know, I hate to say fortunate too much, but I've always been part of the majority. You know, I was yeah. raised in a middle-class family. You know, I, I was well-educated. Um, I, I had a lot of privilege in my life by going to the Naval Academy and all that stuff. I had never been in a minority group. And so that was the first time in the world that I was put in this minority group due to factors outside my control, which was being a woman, essentially. Yeah. And I didn't know that was an issue. My parents raised me that my brother and I were the exact same and mm -hmm. we would achieve the same thing. And so that mindset was instilled in me. And then for the first time ever, I was kind of treated different because of being a woman or being single and these things. And, and so that really created an obstacle for me. And that was difficult. Um, and it really taught me a lot about myself and about others and really about leadership and bias and empathy. And because I think you grow most during those challenging situations. And for me, it was going through that and experiencing it. And it totally transformed how I treated people and then how I approached leadership as well. Um, and so the growth afterwards was, was huge for me and going back to the Naval Academy and then applying the things that I had learned by overcoming, you know, adversity. Um, that was most important. I'm happy to dig in more if you want, but I yeah, hope that kind of. Well, I definitely want to dig in more to what you talked about talked about uh earlier as far as like some of the experiences that you've had you know i don't want to brush by those um it, having some uh interactions with the russians you said and uh you know the first first woman to uh fly in combat I, I believe and drop some bombs on isis and some other things some other great big firsts that you had as a female pilot um you know i i think when you mentioned the russians i automatically you, and you mentioned goose which like for those that I, I don't know what that is it's like it's top gun uh reference <laughs> first of all and yeah. i just think of uh you know they were communicating uh foreign relations as they were inverted right so uh, yeah correct that's what i want to uh <laughs> as i heard you talking about that but yeah please talk maybe about some of those experiences that you had that you mentioned that you can talk about and yeah. uh and and how did some of those experiences as a leader like really how, how do you take those and apply them to what you're doing um, now in the civilian world oh yeah so there's so many so i think first kind of starting off keying in on that that russian experience in that 
In 2014, when we departed, we left on Valentine's Day 2014, and never did we expect to have the deployment that we did. We expected it to be very calm. We were going to, you know, go over to Afghanistan and do nine months in Afghanistan, fly, and we were doing a drawdown in troops and turning over um, the basically control of Afghanistan to the Afghan people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was going to be very stabilization operations, very calm and very mundane with, for yeah. lack of a better term. Um, and sure enough, we got into the Mediterranean and the Russian aircraft carrier, the Kuznetsov, pulled off or pulled out for the first time in a decade. And they had eight Su-33 MKK Flanker Js on board, which are their premier version yeah. of naval aircraft. And so it was kind of a standoff. And it's so amazing that you read about this stuff in the news, you know, yeah. and you read about this in the history books and you're like, no way. And then when you experience it in <laughs> right. real life, you're yeah. like, wow, this okay. is international yeah. relations. And it's like, yeah. okay, don't cause a big um, international incident here and yeah. de-escalatory mindset. And, you know, let's just be professionals and be excellent at what we do. And so that was the first thing. And it's just like, that's incredible. wow. What I think I learned from that is when you're over there, and I think a lot of people in the military have experienced that, when you're over there and you're the person actually making these very high level decisions and interacting with our adversaries one-on-one, -on -one, it really helps you understand the international politics and, and really what's going on. And, and you yeah. have to understand that when you read in the news, you're only getting a small tidbit of what the real story is. And so I think it taught me to take everything with a grain of salt and say, hey, what's the other side of the story? What's actually going on here? And how do these small little grains of sand, how do they combine to create a whole beach and to create that whole picture? And so I think in all these different current events, understanding and trying to dig deeper and get the whole story and yeah. realizing that a lot of us, we're kept in the dark a lot of times because it's for our own safety or for the safety of the troops who are abroad. And and just realizing even in business, it's important because a lot of times you only, we call it looking down a soda straw. So if you pull your so <laughs> straw out of your soda, you know, it's such a small view. Yeah. So you have to pull back and get that higher level view. And as a leader, that's so important because it's easy to drill down and get focused on one thing, but you got to pull up and look at the bigger yeah. picture. Yeah. Um, and then from there, we went through the, you know, Suez Canal. We went out to Afghanistan. We did stabilization operations, supported the first and second rounds of free elections in Afghanistan, which was amazing to see democracy wow. at work yeah. and to see that pivotal moment and how important it was for the Afghan people made it so that every single election I will vote in <laughs> because yeah. they valued their lives or their, they valued their freedom of speech and their ability to vote so much that they went to polling stations that were being threatened by the Taliban. Um, and we were over protecting from the Taliban, trying to keep Taliban away while the innocent people would come in and vote. Um, that was just a really remarkable experience to be part of. Uh, I can so. imagine. Yeah. Incredible. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. What's, what, uh, what is, you know, I think to championship leadership and, and vision being a big part of championship leaders, especially those that, uh, that, operate in our elite at a very high level just like yourself what what what's the vision and impact for you that you want to make um i like you said you didn't you didn't um ever have it in your mind that you're going to write a book but but now you did and now you've kind of also put yourself out as a leader in this space for for a lot of other women right mm -hmm. um the, the path that you paved for others um is that what's that responsibility like maybe number one and then number two like what is what's the vision and the impact of how you want to continue to maybe carry that torch and and uh into the future yeah so kind of relating back to seeing the bigger picture and realizing number one the amount of impact that you can create by making these small, just every day, you're like chipping away at a mountain. You're taking little steps to accomplish this bigger picture goal of empowering and inspiring others. And so um, even just little things, connecting one-on-one -on -one with people and, and because the way that you 
affect someone and the way that you make them feel is going to affect the way that they impact their bigger group. And so the way that influence works, and we all know networks work, it's how you spread, spread your impact and achieve that. And, yeah. and so I think that's important. And so every day achieving this bigger picture is those little actions. And then number two, I think is finding your why and really going back to that at the end of the day and saying, what did I do today to achieve that end goal and that why and that vision and staying true to those motivators that exist with inside, within you and, and working to continually do that. Obviously you're gonna change and you're gonna adapt and you're gonna evolve over time, but staying true to those core values and, and figuring out things that are going to continue. It's like a pinball machine, you know, you're trying to, yeah. you're bouncing off the edges and trying to narrow your vision and, and drive towards the end goal. And so for me right now, that looks like, you know, during this COVID crisis, it's been crazy. Yeah. You know, everything has kind of been shattered and shotgunned. And it's like, okay, now what can I do every day to bring that path down? And so a big step for me has been pursuing an MBA. So um, now I can complement my leadership expertise. So my master's degree in leadership and all the experience that I've had there with the business acumen to be effective in the private sector and to be able to understand these larger scale organizations and CEOs to be able to magnify my impact and my influence within that sector. That's awesome. I love it. So, um, what's, what is a moment for you where, you know, this is one of, uh, one of my favorite questions here is like, what, what's a defining moment or a critical moment that you've had? I know, most of us have many, many of these moments, but maybe one that comes to mind where it's kind of that fork in the road. You, you made the decision that you did, which has you where you are today or which has you on the path that you are. Um, but had you not, it could have, it, you know, you'd be in a completely different place in life because I think that a lot of the listeners, they could very well be in this moment right now, right? Where they're at that fork in the road, they really kind of feel like they want to go to the right, but everybody else maybe is pulling them to the left and it's just a difficult decision and they don't know what to do. Um, is there a moment for you that, that really sticks out top of mind? I think it's great to hear these stories from others that have made the decisions, had the courage and, and, and see that, Hey, it worked out. Yeah. So like you said, there's so many throughout my path yeah. that have been very pivotal moments that have led me to these incredible opportunities. And for me, I always look at it as open doors. You know, there are so many doors that are open to you. And by working hard and, you know, persevering through adversity, you're going to have so many doors and it's which door do you choose to go through, yep. you know, um, not necessarily close the others, but which path are you going to go down? And sometimes you make that decision for yourself. And sometimes somebody else makes it for you or due yep. to circumstances, you know, just the situation that you're in, it means that you need to go one direction and it wouldn't necessarily be your first choice. So for me, an experience like that was at the Naval Academy my senior year. So we go through a service selection, which means selecting your job that you're going to do after the Naval Academy. Everyone has to mandatory, mandatorily serve five years at least. And so what are you going to do that? I only wanted to be a pilot, which means front seat. And I had all the grades. I had the physical qualifications. I had everything lined up. And so I was a shoe in I was like, oh, I've got this in the bag. No big yeah. deal. And sure enough, the day came and they told me in front of all my peers, they said, you've been selected as a Naval flight officer. Congratulations. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you've worked for this for your entire, you know, academic career, yeah, then the Naval Academy, it was a huge disappointment because it meant, yes, it was great. I would still fly in planes, but I would be in the back seat. And I felt that I had deserved the front seat, but you know, I maintained my cool. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I went back to my room when the ceremony was over and I was a little disappointed. My brother called and he I'm said, ready. Hey, did you get pilot? Congratulations. And I said, no, I'm devastated. I got Naval flight officer and he goes, whoa, 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 stop. It's okay. And he's like, think about it. He goes, this could be the best thing that ever happened to you, you know, and now it's up to you what you're going to make of it. And so even when you have to take something that might not be your first choice, or you make a decision and you say, hey, I'm gonna go this way. It's all about attitude and what you make of it. And sure enough, my brother was right. Best thing that ever happened to me because it opened the door to fly in fighter jets and to do 
everything that I was allowed to do in my career. And that might not have happened if I would have gone pilot. And so I think it's making the decision. And then once you make that decision, it's, it's hard. It's really tough. But then you go all in, you know, you go 120% in and say, I am going to be the best X, Y, and Z ever. You know, yeah. I chose this yeah. and I'm going to just go full steam at it. So. I love that. Thank you. That's an incredible story. So yeah, had you been uh, selected as a pilot, that, that doesn't mean that you would have been able to choose the, the type of uh, plane that you were a pilot for. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's it. So I love what your brother did in, in that moment. And was that r- literally all it took for you to really kind of change that perspective for yourself? Yeah. I mean, it definitely, you vacillate back and forth between these, Hey, yes, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And, oh man, I'm still so disappointed. And it's okay to have those feelings. It's, it's yeah. just human nature yeah. in the spectrum, but generally staying on that positive accomplished, you know, I can do this and I'm going to make the best of this. And that's just, something that happens. And I think throughout this crisis, it actually probably has shown a lot of us who we truly are and yeah. made us focus on what's important and okay, you know, plan A didn't work or plan A has shifted. And what does plan B look like? And how are we going to make the best of it? And how are we going to continue to make progress forward to continue to achieve our goals, even if that looks different than it did five months ago or six yeah. months ago. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's incredible that your brother, you know, did that in that moment for you as well and gave you that, that perspective, um, which just makes me think like how important it is to have people like that in your life, right? Because you could have, yeah. yeah, you very easily could have went like way down the other side of the path and just been like super negative about it and just been like, man, what was me? And this is the worst thing ever. And it could have really spiraled into something, you know, potentially it, it could have taken that opposite direction. So, well, and that's um, a huge point is surrounding yourself by those people who, yes. who force you and really challenge you and push you in the direction that, that is best for you. And for me, I'm, I have my family, you know, I have my brother and now his wife and my parents and I have my close friends. And, you know, there are some people that you want to just listen to you when you do have a bad day and vent about it and um, who can, who can be that shoulder to lean on, but who also have your best interest at heart and challenge you to ask those questions and say, Hey, what do you really want? And, and how are you going to achieve that? And, I think that not only just your support network, but also your mentors too, who you can go to. And, and that's what it's about in being a leader is surrounding yourself by that network. Who's going to continue to drive you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do want to respect your time, but, uh, who may, we have your brother who was an incredible showed up as an incredible leader at an incredible time for you. Are there any other leaders that maybe come to mind coaches, mentors that, that have really impacted you and, and maybe more so like what, what is it specifically about them that, that stands out, um, from a leadership characteristic, uh, that maybe you've taken to help mold you and who you are as a leader. There are just so many in my <laughs> I book. I write about bullet who, Uh, was our strike group admiral and he was a two-star admiral at that time and he would fly with us all the time and and I go through a whole section of where I list bullets from bullet that I learned and the number one thing I learned from him in being in such a senior role he had 7,500 people working for him billions and billions of dollars of assets and weaponry and ships and nuclear submarines that worked for him but he was the most personable guy and he would listen and he cared and he would show the junior most person on the ship. He would go up and, you know, put his hand on their shoulder and, and say, Hey, tell me what's going on and show me your job. And these people would just light up and be so excited to share what they did day in and day out to make the ship work and to make the mission happen. And, and that really taught me to appreciate people and show them. And, and that people will always remember how you make them feel. And so it can just be a little thing. And that's what Bullet taught me. You know, there was, I had another mentor at the Naval Academy and we'll call him Andrew. Um, And he was special operations. He was a Navy SEAL. 
He has a PhD. This, this man is so brilliant and accomplished and just badass. I can't help but yeah. say it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, he really would take the time again to, to listen and say, okay, what's going on and, and make you feel like a real person. And, oh, I totally understand that. And he was relatable and, and would come down to your level and say, you know what? Oh, I get that. I get that. Okay. Now, how do we make that better? What's the next step we can take forward and take the, the challenges that you would face and create an actionable timeline of how we could overcome it and make it better for the overall organization by thinking outside the box. And so that was another one. And then just now that I'm out in the private sector, it's been remarkable how many men and women who have reached out to me and who say, you know, seriously, anything I can do for you and who will have these conversations with me, um, they're amazing mentors. And what I've really learned from that is people want to help. People yeah. want to bring, you know, smart up and coming people behind them with them along this journey. And so being able to reach out and connect with people and trust them and say, you know, hey, here's what I'm going through now. What do you think, what, what are my next steps in this journey? And, and being able to just take advantage of the opportunities we're afforded and reach out and really engage those people to get you to the next level is, is huge because they learn as much from you as you do from them and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, I love bullet. Like, is there a better nickname? I don't think so. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Such a great guy. <laughs> Was that his uh, call sign? That's his call sign. Correct. Bullet. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I appreciate you so much uh, for this time today and uh, it's been awesome. It's been incredible. Um, before we go, one last question, what would be one or two things that it, you could give to the listeners that if they were to implement today, it would help them move their life forward today? Oh man, those are, that's a challenging one. Know, There's just right? so much stuff that you can do. <laughs> I think number one that I've been really engaging in this time of great uncertainty is creating a positive feedback loop for myself. Because now being an entrepreneur and, you know, sole proprietor, it's tough because you don't get that constant feedback that I was used to from the military. And so creating a positive feedback loop for myself of setting goals and then working towards achieving them and then following up on that and saying, hey, what went well? What could have gone better? And um, how can I assess my progress for the day or for the week or for the month? That's been really huge for me. So creating that for yourself whether it's creating a to-do list, it could be as simple as that, or really taking time to think about what your goals are, articulating them, and then you know making smart goals. Um, that's a great thing to do. Yeah. That's been a huge, I would say, strategy for myself to be able to get to the next level and really survive during this time. Uh, number two, I would say, find what you enjoy most and continue to do that. So on the ship, we would say, hey, never skip on the hard pack. And so that means hard pack is ice cream. <laughs> and that would be like the <laughs> cartons of ice cream. And you know, some days you just have to indulge in the things that you yeah. love. And sometimes that's ice cream. And so whether that's ice cream or getting out and going hiking or biking and yeah. uh, figuring out a creative way to achieve those things is, is huge. So I'll leave you with just two, but find your passion and just go that way. And then- and Never skip the ice cream. I like it. Never yeah. skip ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Yeah, Bye for sure. Appreciate that. And thank you so much. Uh, it's been, it's been great. It's been a fun conversation. Appreciate you coming on. Um, what are a few ways we can, we can find out more about you, follow you, uh, get a copy of your book. Yeah. So number one, get a copy of my book. It's jet girl. Um, it's available on Amazon or on Audible, you can go on and, and get the audio version of it and hang out with me for a couple hours. Um, or you can order a custom signed one on my website. My website is www.jetgirlusa.com. And then you can follow along with me on Instagram. That's jetgirlusa um, or LinkedIn, whatever works best for you. Um, I'm out there and I respond to my DMs, I promise. <laughs> Might yeah, take it me a couple might days, take her a while, but she, she'll do it. No, I'm just messing. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. We're digging out right now. Yeah, Almost I bet. Clear. <laughs> um, did you read the book? Is it you that's actually on the Audible version? 
Yeah, it it was oh, one perfect. of the most challenging things I've ever done. Uh, Four days in the yeah. studio. Yeah. Hard. But I do love it when the author actually reads the book. So uh, that'd be my next in queue for sure. So thank you so much for, for taking time today, Caroline. I uh, appreciate you being here. Nate, thank you so much. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.